Hi, this is Carrie Ann Reed Brown, and this is Carry On Friends, the Caribbean American podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Carry On Friends, the Caribbean American podcast. I'm excited today because we're going to be talking to three amazing ladies on a very important topic. So welcome, Mashida, Lisa, and Melissa to the Carry On Friends podcast. So Melissa is an alumni. She's been on it before. So Mashida, why don't you tell the community of friends a little bit about who you are, Caribbean country you present, and all that good stuff. Okay. Well, my name is Mashida Phillip. I am from Grenada, and I am a filmmaker, um, Canadian-American filmmaker based here in New York. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be on this morning. (laughs) Awesome. Lisa? Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Harewood, and I'm a UK-based Barbadian, um, I would say filmmaker, but now I'm I'm kind of telling stories across lots of different digital platforms. Um, and yeah, I'm, I've been here in the UK for about three years and uh, already know Melissa and Mashaida very well. <laughs> and Melissa, welcome back. Thank you for having me on again. I am Melissa Nawal. I'm an award-winning multimedia journalist, and I am a a Guyanese-American, and I focus my work on uh, telling stories of the Caribbean region and diaspora. Awesome. All right. So I want to send a big shout out to Feroza Cayetano out of Belize, because she's the one who reached out to me and said, hey, can you talk about this thing in Belize we, we, we call barrel babies? And, and, you know, barrel babies are barrel children are, you know, those who left behind when a parent goes abroad and they can't take their the child or children with them in their first wave of their immigrant story. And immediately when she requested that, I know that I had to reach out to Melissa because I'm aware of the work Melissa has done. So big up to Ferosa and the whole Belize Massive. And so let's start off there. Like, I know, Melissa, you've, you know, I'm familiar with the work that you've done. So tell us a little bit about the work. And through Melissa, she introduced me to Mashaida and Lisa. So Melissa, tell us a little bit about the work you've done and, you know, how you've worked with or collaborated with Mashida and Lisa. And then we'll, ladies, we'll just get into the topic. Yeah, sounds good. So this, the, the work that I started doing on this issue actually started because of Lisa. And that's why I thought it was so important that if we're having any conversation that Lisa uh, would be a part of that. I saw her film, Auntie. In, I think this was 2016, yes, um, through the uh, Caribbean Film Academy. And when I saw the film, I felt like I saw my family in the sense that I saw a uh, you know, situation that, or, or an experience that you know, the young uh, girl in the, in the uh, film Auntie had where she, you know, her mom sent for her and then she left behind the, her caregiver, her auntie, and went and joined her mother. Now that was a situation I had seen in my own family but it never hit me that, oh, like this could be something where, you know, people have, you know, or it creates some kind of friction or issues within a family. But after seeing the film and having the opportunity to speak with Lisa, I wanted to look into so that and that film was, you know, um, you know, based on on things that we go through. But it, it was a it, it wasn't um, something, you know, the, the people in it were actors. But I, I thought to myself, what about the people that I see every day? What about my family? What about friends? What about people in the community who've had this experience? I want to know more. So I interviewed Lisa. I learned about the Barrel Stories Project. And then I decided um, in meeting people who had gone through this experience, one of the things that stuck out to me was uh, mental health and how it impacts mental health. And so I decided to dig deeper into that aspect of it and turn it into a... Uh, um, a series for NBCnews.com and look at the mental health impact of parental separation due to migration on Caribbean children. And so that's how that got started. But then it really kind of took on a life of its own. And I feel that um, I'm really thankful to uh, Lisa and uh, as well as Mashida because I realized that there is a com- there is a community of people who are doing really important work around this. Myself from a reporting 
uh, standpoint, Mashida and uh, Lisa in, in film and in other mediums, but there's a community of people who know that this is a major issue and have been taking their roles and their platforms to address it in different ways, which I think is important because we've been able to reach several different audiences in that regard. Thank you for that, Melissa. So that brings me to you, Lisa. Lisa, tell me about Auntie and the inspiration behind that story and why, I mean, I know why we have to tell that story, but really what was that thing that said, you know what? No, I mean, it's a story that we all know, but I have to tell it. So what was that driving force behind Auntie and telling that initial story and then the Barrel Stories project? Well, I always I always start out by letting people know I'm not a barrel child myself, but um, like a lot of people in the Caribbean, I was shifted between different households when I was growing up. That's what we do, right? We we figure out who has the resources at the time to best, you know, help the child. And so quite often people are moved from household to household. And I had the, I always tell people that the nuclear family outside the Caribbean is, you know, mother, father children nuclear family often in the caribbean is grandmother aunt mother yes right yes. and so that was my that was those are my three parents and um and so i moved between households and i kind of i had an understanding that it creates some feelings of divided loyalties and you know you're closer to your grandmother than you might be to your mother you know mm-hmm. all these different dynamics that are a bit uh, you know a little bit complex and maybe we don't talk about that much and uh in the late 90s i read a, a novella that really touched me called Aunt Jen. It's by uh, somebody who taught me at UE in Jamaica. Uh, She's actually a Spanish professor, Dr. Paulette Ramsey. And that was a simple collection of letters from a child to their mother who they'd never met. And it just struck me that we don't really talk about the, we talk about the economic impact of migration, right? We talk a lot about remittances and how the Caribbean relies on these migrants going out and we're, it's so normalized, right? I, th- I think I read a, st- a statistic early on that said something like two thirds of people who re- um, identify as Caribbean nationals live outside the Caribbean. Yeah. Well, well, a lot of those people are parents and they don't all take their children with them at the time of migration. And they're not all legal migrants. so They're not able to bring their children eventually. So what does this do to us as Caribbean people? What does it do to the, to the migrants? What does it do to the children? What does it do to the wider family and wider community and society? So in 2013, I had a chance to apply to the Commonwealth Foundation. They were doing a global call for stories about intergenerational love. And I thought that this story of the love between a caregiver and a child and and the kind of the love triangle, right, Mm -hmm. between the parent, the child and the person who's actually looking after the child in, in the parent's absence. Could we look at that and and make a, an interesting story out of it? And I made the film, you know, kind of expecting that, yes, it would show a few festivals and that would be the end of that. And I would go on and make another film on another subject. And we're now where we're in 2019. And six years on, that film shows somewhere every week. I saw it last week. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it show, it's showing in it's screening in London in two places in London later on this week. It, yeah, it's screened in New York at the, the I think it was the New Rochelle Library. Uh, it's screened in China. It's, I mean, it's it's somewhere all over the world and it's freely available online. And so I know there are lots of screenings that happen um, where I don't even know that people are, are, are screening it. And out of people writing to me and saying, you know, you've you've shown me something that I never thought I would see on screen. This is my life. Or I never understood why I wasn't so close to my mom and I understood it from watching your film. Um, Then I started recording the real stories of people. I started going to people's houses in New York, in Toronto, here in London, in the Caribbean, and with a tape recorder and just asking them questions and have put some of those stories online on the on the Barrel Stories Project um, website. And at that point is where I met Melissa and, you know, Melissa's work has really been able to amplify the impact of the project, has really been able to reach it beyond what I could have possibly done myself um, by letting people, you know, by validating people's experiences. I think people can relate to it, but maybe they felt like they didn't, um, their experiences weren't that big a deal. Um, by allowing people to talk about it and say, yes, migration is great and it brings a lot of opportunity, but here is a potential downside, Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, what Mashaid is doing, what Melissa has done, the work that I'm doing, other people are doing have said to people, it's okay to feel conflicted about this experience that you may have had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. Because I, I was about to ask, well, well, I need to say auntie, <laughs> you know, so we'll, we'll get to that. Mashaida, let you jump in and tell us a little bit about the work you're doing around telling these stories about immigration and the impact of families. Well, um, I'm sitting here and I'm actually, um, I'm very cold right now um, because I am a baritized. So I, I think that I thought that I have worked through all my um, nits and crannies, but every single time you're in a forum like this, it comes right back in emotionally. Um, well, I met Lisa actually when I started the whole process. I was hiding behind my own sheet and my own experiences, and I think I reached out to Lisa because I, I, I think I saw Auntie in my research, and I wanted to know a little bit more about the processes. And um, while in grad school getting my master's, I had to come up with a subject um, to do my thesis on. And I wanted to go and do a fancy dance around everything else but look within. But it got down to the point where I had to address my own personal experiences with this. And um, that's how um, Scars of a Mother's Dreams were birthed. And it was a emotional roller coaster because now I had to steer um, the conflicts within the internal conflicts within my own family personally um, and put it out there for the wider public um, to see. And um, through that process came with some measures of healing. Um, we, I think we are still healing. How many years later? Um, I started this process in 2016 to 2019, um, three years later. Uh, we're still going through this. And it's even before that, I've always thought that my experiences, as um, Lisa mentioned, um, was unique to me. I questioned a lot about my, um, my behavioralism, my um, isolation to the world, my lack of trust, um, the lack of connection with my maternal mother, um, even though our separation was only a short period of time, like seven years. But what I recognize in this process was the time frame when the separation between my mom and I occurred. That was such a pivotal time mm-hmm. in the bonding part. And because we lost that, that portion, our relationship has always been different. Mm-hmm. And I am in my 40s right now, and I'm still battling with that. Um, my sister, on the other hand, was much older. Um, she was a few years older than, than myself, and they had a different relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so their relationship is completely different. And my brother and I, we have a whole complete um, different relationship with, with our mom. But there was so much to deal with. And we're from a community where we do not talk about things. There's an elephant in the room, right? Yeah, I was about to say that the, the our natural tendency as a people to not mm-hmm. talk about things compounds a situation, right? So even or even if you don't talk about things, I think, you know, the 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 I, I just have an, an interview, it didn't hear yet the whole thing about sparing the rod and spoiling the child sometimes you know this display of emotion is parents considered as a weakness as an opening for for children to feel like oh they will take advantage of you you must have always have a strong front Mm -hmm. i think that also impacts you know as a child you know when you know like when there's a distance do you say oh baby i love you and i miss you it's always like you're behaving yourself, you're doing this, you're doing, you're, you're doing good in school. And yes, <laughs> you're not communicating that emotional aspect of it in terms of, you know, I miss you or reinf- the, the tools that we know now. And I don't really blame the parents because I don't think they had the tools to know that this is what they were supposed to do. And it felt awkward to them, <laughs> you know, versus right. no. So Mashida, tell me a little bit about you know, was there a conversation? Was there a sit down that said, you know, you know, I'm, I'm mommy's going to America or it's just like, okay, one day I get up and mommy pack our bags. I mean, I've heard stories like that where one day mommy just gets up and gone. And, or was there a conversation to prepare you that this is what was going to happen? No, for me as a child, 
all I recall was my mom leaving. I did not know um, the conditions behind it leaving. So I remember being shifted, um, being left with my aunt, which was her younger sister, and then shifting from my aunt, um, who decided to live her life. Because when you're looking back in retrospect, she was a young person in her 20s. So she left. Um, she dropped me off to my um, father's mother, um, mother, who I did not have like a relationship with. So this was a whole brand new family because my sister was, and my brother was already living there with them. And, and that was the, the premise of how um, that separation occurred. And to my mom's defense, she has always been that mother who would try to reassure you and say she loves you and everything like that. But then um, all I recall was seeing the pictures coming back also of um, the white children that she was taking care of. So mm. to me, as that child, that was her new family. Yeah. So you left me, and that's your new family. And um, I was a very protected, guarded child from my mom. So my lifestyle has, was also immediately shifted. So whereas I was the baby being taken care of, when I moved to my um, grandmother's house, I became now the caregiver or the babysitter to my um, little cousins. So responsibilities also immediately shifted. And, you know, you don't really know what's going on. You just have to deal with it. Because if you say no, you're a rebellious child. If you're emotional, you're weak, you know. And we had to go back and forth like that for several years. So when... When my mom finally came back to get us um, and we had that reunification, there was a lapse in time because for my mom also, she was dealing with her own um, emotional um, issue. So for her, she treated us as babies that she thought was left, but did not realize the time frame that has passed. And now we're matured into teenagers, finding ourselves and finding our ways so that disconnect that was there between us um, created problems. So we got here in New York. And again, therapy and talking is just something that was not um, a part of the program. So life just went on. But there was always underlining issues um, that was dealing with us. And it took me years. I, I, I think I mentioned that at the the stuff that Melissa had organized when she and we started the panel. It took me getting married in my 30s to recognize the, the emotional trauma that was set up during that era yeah. um, of separation. So you're talking about almost 20 something years before I actually address the real issues, issues. that we're dealing with. You know, you said something about the pictures coming back of your mom taking care of, you know, the white children or these other families. And I remember years ago, I was listening to Stacey Marie Ishmael, and she was a guest on Another Round podcast, which is no longer an active podcast. And she was talking about how the very same thing, like these Caribbean women would come here to work, leave their children behind, but they're turning around taking care of a whole other set of children growing closer to these children that they're taking care of on a daily basis versus, you know, the issue that they have left their kids behind. Is there, Lisa or, or Melissa, is this something that has come up in your research or, or in the telling of these stories? Is this something that, you know, other people have dealt with or has this come up as a theme or pattern? And, right. you, you know, I'm curious. Yeah, so it, it definitely has um, several times over. And I first, I'd want to make a, a distinction. So the the word barrel child, right? It was it was a is a term that was coined by Jamaican sociologist Dr. Claudette Crawford Brown, and um, you know, longtime sociologist at the University of West Indies uh, Mona campus. And she made a very important distinction in the definition, right? So not not every child that is left behind by a parent is is necessarily a barrel child. child. And yeah. and that is because, you know, uh, the distinction of a, a barrel child is a child who lacks that emotional 
nurturance as Mashida was, you know, uh, talking about. They, they lack that emotional nurturance, that bond, that connectivity with a parent. So not necessarily every child that is left behind lacks that, but for the children who do, that is why they are considered barrel children because they don't have that emotional connection. They don't have that emotional tie. And that's where a lot of the problems do stem from. And uh, when it comes to the work that I did, the series I worked on for um, NBC News uh, with the support of the Pulitzer Center, um, International Centers for Journalists and USC Center for Health Journalism was looking at um, the, those, uh, how it looks to a child, right? So to a parent is I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to support my family. I'm doing this for my family. You know, I'm trying to do better for my family. But the way it, it would appear to a child is that, you know, you left me behind and you don't, you know, you don't care about me anymore. And that's something that came up so many times. But when I would speak to parents, they said, well, I was doing this for the family with the best interest of my children. But to the children, it came across as, you know, well, you left me. And when it, when it comes to the kind of work that they were doing, um, mm -hmm. I, I address a lot in my series, um, the fact that parents came here on particular visas, right? Some of them, and that was the kind of work that they were able to get at that point in time to support their children. But of course, that disconnect being there and maybe that conversation not happening between a parent and a child, or even them saying, you're gonna be staying with, you know, Auntie Jane and th these are these will be the house rules and this is how we check in. It just left so many unanswered questions that you see a picture like that in Mashida's case, and uh, and so many. I you know I had seven year olds, fifteen year olds. I spoke to twenty five year olds, and it, it was just to them. They were just like I saw those pictures, or I saw her other life, and I didn't feel like I fit into that. And I also felt you know feelings of abandonment mm -hmm. um, uh, were a really really big issue. And I you know speaking to people of all different age groups, that was something that stuck out as a theme overall. Also, um, what about, cause I, the very first time to be, to be honest that I realized, you know, you, you know, like I said, before we hit record, you know, my cousin lived with me and, you know, I, by your definition, the definition that you just told me, she technically wasn't a barrel child. Right. But the reality is her mom lived in the U S and she was living with, her, she was living with her father's sister and her father's mother. And she, you know, her, her maternal grandmother, we all lived in the same community. So she, she went between houses. Right. And so there she, I felt like maybe she was still impacted that her mother wasn't there because she looked around and everybody else's mother was there and hers wasn't, even though right. she was probably getting some emotional care and her mother, you, you know, there's still an right. impact there but of course um but but i want you to address that but what also happens is you know with demarara gold i saw that one woman play there's this yeah. other element that that play brought out like what happens when the parent moves over leaves a child but while in the process of living here they also have another child so mm -hmm. how how does that come up and how how do all these things affect the child or children left back home because in addition to taking care of somebody else, children, sometimes they, they come and have a whole different, they, they come up here and they have now a new baby brother or sister or both or two. And then, you know, what happens in those scenarios as well, the relationship with the sibling born in America versus those left home? That came up a lot uh, for me in some recent work that I've been doing. So apart from the Barrel Stories project, I also recently did a virtual reality um, piece as part of a research project where we looked at whether or not virtual reality could allow parents and children to sort of step into each other's shoes and see the same situation from each other's mm. perspectives and use that as a tool for starting a conversation. And for a lot of the people that I talk to, that's very, very common over here in the UK. You hear a lot about the Windrush generation who came over in the 50s and 60s. That was a common thing of them coming here and having British born children. So if you imagine you then bring your children over from Jamaica or Barbados or wherever. You've got siblings. A lot of the times they weren't told that they had siblings who mm -hmm. were born. They met them for the first time when they arrived here and saw some eyes peeping at them through the stairwell, as one woman told me. Your siblings speak a different, um, with a different accent mm -hmm. than you do. They like different foods than you do. 
Um, I remember one woman in Canada that I interviewed, her parents had um, gone to Canada and, but had come to the UK first and then migrated to Canada. And when her parents brought her over, her and her sister, she said for the rest of their lives, it was team Jamaica versus team Mm. Canada. That, That those two sets of siblings never really were able to bridge that gap one set called their parents mommy and daddy and the ones who were brought over initially called their parents sir and ma'am right because they didn't feel that that bond um you know one other person that i spoke to you know michelle alluded to it the age at which you leave has a great impact on whether or not your children are going to remember you or feel a bond with you if you leave a child usually uh younger than five they will have no memory of you and i don't think parents understand this and so they they expect these children to sort of come to the UK or the US or Canada or wherever and immediately throw their arms open and go, mommy, mm-hmm. right? And that's not what happens. And the parents are, are quite often deeply hurt by this and don't understand the kind of psychology behind it. They just, they just kind of immediately withdraw and tend to turn more to the children who, are, who they have an easier relationship right. with. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that just continues and snowballs and snowballs mm-hmm. and snowballs. And it's, it's so common. Um, yeah. And I, I'm sure that's something that Mashaida could speak to for more from a first-hand perspective. I mean, I've, I've had it on both sides because both parents migrated. Um, my father has another building family all together. And um, you, you find that. You find that when um, my father's American children came back, they were treated differently from um, um, maybe because that was my father's mom, you know, but still they were welcomed differently. They were treated differently. Um, so you always have that level of jealousy, competition that is existing, whether you're um, blatantly saying it or not, but there's an underlining um, tone that is there. And it comes back down to communications. Um, we talked about it, we needed it, that Broken conversations do not heal the trauma that is existing. Yeah. And in order for us to move forward, we definitely have to address these things. Because I remember when I sat down with my mom after going to therapy, after speaking to psychologists, up to, to the, up to today, I think, after my film has been shown several in several different countries, um, the University of, um, in Grenada had invited me to speak about this issue. There are some members of my family who still do not believe that that level of impact is real. Um, it was more or less like I just wanted attention and I'm just seeking it out. I was told if I wanted to have a different relationship with my mom, the onus was on me to make that happen. Mm-hmm. But I was tired. Mm-hmm. How, how, how do you know how to deal with all of that? You know, right. so we still go back and forth with that. And it, I, like I said earlier, I, I did not realize how much it's still impacting me. And it's only when I started this process of doing scars, I sat with my mom and I asked her, I said, you left me. I remember sitting days in and days out waiting for my mom to come for the car to drop her back. And it never happened. And that's when I found out she basically left for vacation. That's what my mom did. My mom did not leave us to come here to find work. My mom was an entrepreneur. She had her own business, but she came here on vacation. She got the opportunity. She took it because she saw an opportunity to make more money and give us a different life. And that's how my story got started. So I got caught up in this web, unknown to the fact. And probably if when we came here, when I was 15, 16, and we had that conversation and some level of healing was done then, maybe the outcome would have been different, but because nothing was discussed, yeah. we just continue um, building up this resistance and this um, animosity. And this, like, I, 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 had, I, I remember a portion of my life, I felt my mom owed me tremendously. So everything that I wanted, she had a right to give it to me. And I had a worse attitude. But I think it was me calling out for help, right? And yeah. not knowing these things. So I think what, I'd, um, what did it for me was the fact that when we got here, just seeing how she interacted with these children she raised from birth until that was her love. And, you know, she loved us dearly. My mom loved us. She still does. My mom would do anything for us. 
But that emotional connection that she had, I think I am still be trying to um, come to terms with it sometimes because I don't have that with her, you know. And um, my mom still cannot wrap her. I mean, I'm not, maybe she choose not to, um, but from where I stand, I don't think she still wraps that um, that notion around the fact that it's a, it's a broken bond between us mm-hmm. and she gave it to someone else and not us, you know? So I see that being repeated in generations within the family that's the same, and it's crazy. It, it is absolutely crazy. So, and go ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, one thing I wanted to add was that one thing that continued to come up again and again is like, you know, uh, so... In, in addressing this uh, from a reporting standpoint, there was a lot of um, support for uh, people who said, this was my story. I never, you know, I, I never knew this was someone else's. So people really wanted to hear the stories. But then you had people who said, this is just airing, you know, the dirty laundry of Caribbean people. This is, you, you shouldn't do this. But one thing, one thing that came up over and over again was that culturally, um, you know, because it migration is often looked at from an economic standpoint it's viewed as you know something very positive it's good you know like your parents gone gone away you're going to get all the things coming back for you like what what more could you want right. than the yeah. things that you're receiving and the thing is that you know that things can come and go but a bond is something that you cannot buy yeah. um and one thing that really struck me was i sat with a a, a doctor audrey pottinger she's a clinical psychologist in mm-hmm. jamaica and one of some of the research she did showed that people whose parents died yeah. tended to fare better than those who were estranged for their, from their parents due to things like, you know, parental separation or migration. And she was so surprised by that. But then she said it was due to the fact that culturally, you know, like death is something that's acknowledged. It's supported. People get that, like, mm-hmm. psychologically, you need support. You're grieving. But when it comes to a parent who's away, it's like, what do you want? Like, you're good. They're doing everything. Why? You're being ungrateful. They're doing this for you. So in that sense of not like that lack of community acknowledgement as well, it's something that has weighed on so many children because they feel like they have no right to say, well, no, I mom or dad, I want your time. You know, I want to connect with you in that way. And I found that so much to the point where, so we interviewed about 40 people for the series from, you know, children to caretakers, parents, you know, social workers, that kind of thing. And what really struck me was hearing kids say that they don't feel like they have the the right to even like mention this to their parent. Um, uh, or people, grown adults who are like, you know, 13, 14 years later, I don't even, I still have yet to address this conversation because I don't feel like I have that right. And that really s- struck me and it, it, it gave me some pause. It made me feel really sad. It made me feel really sad. I mean, one of the things, if, if I could just jump in here, one of the things I wanted to also say was, you know, this is not unique to the Caribbean. Every single immigrant community has this issue. I mean, I was catching up on a new series of Orange is New Black last night and there was one of the characters who had migrated from Puerto Rico and she waited, you know, too long. And by the time she sent for her daughters, they basically said, no, we're not coming. They, they didn't have that bond with her anymore, didn't, wouldn't call her mummy. And I, I looked at that and I just thought, yeah, like this is the story of so many immigrant communities. When um, barrel stories started being made, I had people asking me, am I going to do one on the Philippines? Because Filipino women tend to go out as nannies and they tend to go out as uh, healthcare workers. They, they look after older people in, in retirement homes. Uh, the Nigerian community in the UK has a very unique um, take on, on what they do with children. They call it child farming. It, it's what immigrant communities do. And I think part of what makes me really empathize with parents, um, it's, it's, I think it's quite easy and natural to empathize with the children. But I also empathize with the parents because when you've been doing this for generations, this kind of shutting down of conversations is a kind of coping mechanism, right? Is, yeah. When mm-hmm. when I, most of the people that I talk to for Barrel Stories are children. And when I say children, they, they run the gamut from 22 to 60 years old. When I have had the occasion to talk to the few parents who are willing to speak, 
what I got from them was the pain of separation was so deep for them that they had to kind of shut down certain conversations. Um, the one woman who was very forthcoming with me, who's a social worker in, in Brooklyn, she said, you know, every baby she saw on the street, she nearly burst into tears. Every little shoe, she, she just felt this deep, deep pain of not being able to have her own children with her. And if we think about where this shifting of children comes from, it goes back to slavery, right? Your child mm-hmm, yeah. can be plucked from your arms at any moment and sold to another place. There was no family unit that was respected. And over generations, we figured out ways. And I think it's quite, we have to pat ourselves on the back for this in a certain way. We figured out ways to create family units that are, are flexible and adaptable and that can still come together and raise a child, even in the absence of biological parents, right? But at the same time, what we haven't done is delved into what the the downside of that is. When when grown people say to me, you know, every time I got a barrel, I wish my mother would hop out. I wasn't Mm -hmm. interested anymore in the cereal or the shoes, like the, the, the glamour of that wore off. And I just wanted her to be with me. Parents feel the same longing where they are. They feel the same sense of devastation. And if you're seeing them creating a bond with, you know, children that they're looking after as nannies or, or other families that they're embedded in, part of that is there is also a coping strategy. They need to put that love somewhere that they're not able to mm-hmm. transmit down the phone or through a letter. Um, and so we kind of have to recognize that on both sides and that universally, this is, this is an issue with anybody who has to parent by distance. It's incredibly difficult for them in the absence of being able to hold a child's hand and walk them to school, tuck them in at night, cook them a meal. And that's what Caribbean people do, right? They would go, here's this plate of food. That's my love, right? That's, that's my, my love, love right there on the plate. <laughs> and in the absence of being able to do those things, they genuinely don't know how to convey what they're feeling. And they don't know how to convey those feelings without being so swallowed up by them that they can't function and do what they came to do. So they shut them down. And, and, Period. and yeah. coming yeah. to a point where you can actually have those conversations is a difficult task, task that I think the three of us and lots of other people and Dr. Um, Crawford Brown and Dr. Pottinger, everybody's trying to figure out how do we start those conversations? Caribbean people are not going to necessarily walk through a therapist's door. So can we do Absolutely things not. like this podcast? Can we get people on a website talking to each other? This is the work that we're all engaged in is trying to get people to open up. Yeah. So, you know, what I've recognized also um, for me as someone who went through the process, let me just add this quickly, is finding the right therapy, uh, um, therapy, therapist, sorry, are persons who can culturally relate to what it is. Because you see, it was very difficult um, speaking to someone who does not empathize or who doesn't understand. Yeah. So yeah. it's one thing to say, go to therapy, but then it's another thing, finding the right therapist or the right um, um, caregiver or the right organizations who have a better understanding mm-hmm. culturally what it is you're going through so they can help you identify certain things to, to take you to the next level oh, well, um, because not every therapist is yeah is equipped it, to yeah. do that because yeah. even for me you know I lost my grandmother and Lisa you spoke about it you know you have nuclear family I grew up in a house where my mother my grandmother my uncles that was my family and that was normal mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. have my family in the house so when my grandmother passed away I knew that I was going to have issues with grieving. You know, I, you know, I was the the big one and I took care of everyone else. But when it was time, when, when my grief started to consume me, I, I was intentional about finding a therapist of Caribbean heritage because not all therapists would understand the relationship or the connection I had to my grandmother. And it wasn't like my mother felt less, but I needed a, a, a therapist of Caribbean heritage and I also needed one who had like a spiritual Christian background to understand, like just put those into perspective. And I was recently telling someone that if you are going to go to a therapist, you need to make sure that person is an immigrant or of Caribbean background because they will never understand the, in- the the responsibilities we take up on ourselves it, because they wouldn't. So for lack of a better word, I'll give this ex- example. 
if you are of Caribbean heritage caring for a parent or a grandparent, and this is a natural responsibility that we have, you know, someone who is of a culture that says, all right, your parents sick, you put them in a home, will never be able to understand the issues that you are struggling with. Not so much caring for them, but seeing them in a state that you didn't grow up seeing them. So I think, you know, the, the number one thing about therapy in the Caribbean is understanding that we need to find people who identify. But the problem with that is, and the very person said, well, me no want nobody know my business. And I'm like, you know that the therapist not supposed to tell nobody <laughs> mm. your business by law. Mm. They're not supposed to tell nobody your business. So they intentionally were looking for a non-Caribbean, non-immigrant mm. therapist. And I'm like, you're doing that to your own detriment because yeah. you already are setting yourself up for failure in that session because that person is not going to understand anything. And if, you know, going through therapy, you know, your life, you know, I, I, I love that my therapist helped me through grief because she was able to understand. She wasn't, she would, she didn't judge me and say, well, why? Well, at least you have your mother, even though your grandmother passed, she understood the relationship between grandparents and kids, especially if you grew up in the same house. So I think what Mashida said is critical, absolutely critical for yeah. anyone listening who's thinking of therapy, whether or not you're a barrel child or not. If you have Caribbean background and you're thinking therapy, might be something important. It is super important to find someone of Caribbean background and this HIPAA violation, if they tell your business, <laughs> they're not supposed to tell your business. I repeat that. <laughs> You know, because that's a and, no, that's 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 something people are very very concerned about. And I, I wanted to mention a, a father and a son, Errol Ray Senior and Errol Ray Junior, that were you know featured in part part two of my um, NBC News series. I focused on them a lot because one, I didn't you know a lot of the stories that you know I I had uh, you know told and was working on had been focused on women, but I also wanted to like look at how it affects uh, young men or just men in general. And so this father and son pair, what they did was, you know, so Errol Ray Sr. left his son when he was just a few days old, but he did that because that's when his visa had come through and he wanted to take the opportunity to come to the States and work and support his son. And he, he took, he, he said he made that sacrifice, but he regrets the fact that he missed so many crucial parts of his son's life. So his son came to the States when he was 16 and they had a very rocky relationship because, you know, they spoke every day or they spoke, or they spoke every week, but. But speaking to somebody and living with somebody are two different things. Mm -hmm. And they sought out help from their pastor, you know, who is a Jamaican pastor who they could trust, who is a, is a, a licensed therapist, but could culturally connect mm -hmm. to the issues that were taking place in their home. And they felt that level of comfort because what I was able to, what, what my reporting showed me was that there are no federal programs that address that provide therapy or that provide this kind of support to families once they are reunited. Mm -hmm. What you have are these programs for people who, let's say your family comes here and you are seeking asylum status or refugee status. There is that type of programming, but for people who are separated due to parental migration, parents came here to work, that kind of thing, we found no programs. So as a community, people are, a lot of people have been reaching out to their churches or to someone that recommended them, you know, through someone else that they trust. And that is what have that cultural competency and connection and could understand like why, you know, your dad is telling you, you know, you're in America now, you must do X, Y, Z. And he's just like, but you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. So that was a very, very crucial. And I found that some of the families that were able to have that um, connection to a therapist who had that same understanding it helped them tremendously whereas for others they're still trying to figure out a way to have that conversation to get that help to 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 even talk about it i mean i think so, melissa you sorry I'd, I'd like to put in a little plug here for dr um crawford brown in jamaica because she's written some guides and she's also her particular institute in jamaica trains social workers in jamaica and i think it, you know, there may be people who are not trained to recognize what the follow is of of um, parental separation due to migration, but they can cert there's certain no now a, a few more resources that can help them to understand. I remember when that same screening that I think Melissa came to, somebody in the audience who was I think a white New Yorker said, you know, asked a question about how these parents could abandon their children. 
Yeah, and if you that. heard the collective <laughs> from the audience, <laughs> right? <laughs> because people from outside the culture who don't, who are privileged enough to be able to earn money and find opportunities where they are born and where they live, do not understand the choices that these parents have made. And it is absolutely not, in most cases, absolutely not abandonment. Um, no. Lots of times these parents are not going to reap the rewards of the hard work. It's for the next generation that's really going to reap it through education and through increased opportunity. And so when you sit down in front of a, a mental health professional who immediately passes that kind of judgment, it, mm-hmm. com- it closes everything down. And I think we also have to expand the definition of what therapeutic can look like. When I think about the spaces in which Caribbean people have the the kind of most wide ranging, most comfortable conversations is usually in the salon, in the barbershop chair. You know, there are places and spaces where people have conversations and unburden themselves that are not formal spaces of therapy. And while there are people who do have some deep traumas, a lot of people don't have say the level of trauma that requires them to go and see a therapist or they simply won't do it but a a conversation with other people who've been through the same thing a conversation with a cousin or a friend who says yeah man you I feel that same way like that's exactly what happened to me you know that helps so much a lot of the people who have recorded for barrel stories when I you know sometimes I get up and I think gosh you know am I doing anything you know, really helpful here. I just came and, and, you know, you just dug up all this stuff and I'm going to go. And that's it. Like you're left with these feelings. And more than one person said to me, just being able to be heard and to know that what I'm saying is valid has lifted a huge burden off my shoulders. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of a simple conversation, even with somebody who's completely untrained don't underestimate the power of simply listening to that friend or that family member or that loved one who wants to tell you about these complex feelings and simply saying to them, that's okay that you feel that way. You know, um, and I'm going to get to you, Mashida. So a few episodes ago, I interviewed Marlon Hill, who is very active in the Caribbean community. He's based out in Florida. And we were talking about our immigration stories, right? And how, he said something which I truly believe is an opportunity for social entrepreneurship where it's almost like, you know, we were saying, yeah, you have carnival concierge where everybody help you plan. Is there an organization that can be of a support where people turn to, to say, well, I'm bringing my kids over here. What should I be looking forward to? Because in addition, you know, I, I, as a parent, I can now sympathize with certain things that my mom went through. What kind of schools are they going to get into? How do I, you know, create time to build relationship with my children? Are there any resources already available? You're saying that there's not really any, but do you think there's an opportunity for such an organization to exist to help immigrants, you know, whether even whether it's situations like my mom, where she bring all herself and all our kids at one time or for children who barrel children or non-barrel children in that process, because there is a lot to adjust to coming to America, period, you know? So is, is, is there really an opportunity for such an organization? And if, and, and then, then what are some of the resources, Mashida, for you specifically, would something like that have helped you, you know, maybe even for you to adjust in school or for maybe your mom? I think something like that would, um, I remember speaking to, um, friends and colleagues and we talked about that because um we do not have a place to turn to we really and truly do not have a place to turn to my story there was a level of alienation also because not only did we migrate to um the u.s but we migrated to a predominantly white um community that was another dynamic that we had to kind of cope with and we did not really have resources. So right. we just had to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when, um, yeah, we just had to figure it out. And I think by having those resources, it can really help. Um, because even now with social media, with virtual reality, as Lisa Turn um, spoke about earlier, the dynamics of communication is still different. Right. Yeah. But the bond, the broken bond is still there because there's still that human connection that, you know, that is needed. Mm -hmm. And um, we still 
need to address that because there is still an underlying tone. How do we repair those broken bonds? Uh, because now I think it's even worse. Back then we had airmail that I would wait for a response from my mom if I had an issue. And then by then you, you deal with it, right? But now it's instant. Now the portrayal of that family, of that parent who's living in a foreign country, that kid is seeing that instant replay of what is perceived as their new life here in America. You know, so there's a lot of underlining looming questions that still exist. Uh I think we still need that. So you're saying that because that was a question that I wanted to ask Lisa, all of you, if that came up. So, you know, when I came to America, you know, it was earmail. And then you got phone cards and then now we have, you know, WhatsApp and FaceTime and all of this. And I would, you know, I was thinking whether the improvements in technology made it easier to have more FaceTime or connect with the other parent as opposed to, you know, back in the day when all you had was letters. And, you know, if you got a phone call, it was come put everybody on the phone quick, quick, and you know, talk, you know, because I remember those situations. So I, so you don't think the, the, the technology has improved? Yes, human touch is important. But, you know, I was thinking maybe having more conversations or maybe seeing the face would have helped a little bit. But you're saying it's not? It's No, no, no. Don't. I showed my film at St. George's University in Grenada. Um, I took a scan across the classroom. And I remember um, seeing one of the young ladies, like her whole body, um, position changed and after the film was finished I had a conversation with her and for her she asked me the very same question because now she's sitting in Grenada yes she has that direct um, constant contact with her mom on WhatsApp and all the new technology but the life that she is seeing that her mom is living is something that she's saying she left me and then she lived in a good life. Mm-hmm. So she's interpreting it now as something completely different. Yeah. You know? Um, and that is another layer that needs to be addressed because we still need to rectify this. What is being portrayed on social media? What is being portrayed when you're seeing, when you have that opportunity to see that person's life in real time? Mm-hmm. How is it being interpreted to the kids or to the family being left behind? You know, I am not um, experienced in that way, but that is something for us to really start considering. Lisa did the piece, the research on the virtual reality. Maybe she can lend to what people are saying a little bit more. I mean, I think one of the things we have to kind of get to is even if the technology is there, if you as a parent don't understand fundamentally how to parent from a distance, no amount of technology is going to be helpful. So it it comes down to people understanding how to use, right? It's It's a tool, but quite often it's still used in the same way that we used to use the phone, which is, I just heard the last school report and these grades not looking good and I'm here killing myself for you and you not doing what you're supposed to do, right? It isn't used as a tool for saying, how are you feeling about everything? Let me tell you about, why it's taking so long. Um, Parents have to understand that there needs to be some transparency. They need to explain to their children that every step of the way what's going on, they need to to transmit um, that they love them and that they miss them. And if you, if you aren't emotionally equipped to do that, it doesn't matter if you have FaceTime, WhatsApp, you know, whatever you have, if all you're using it to do is to sort of discipline or do these check-ins that aren't really um, giving the children any real information, kids are going to make up stories in the absence of information. And those stories stay with them for their entire lives. And it's only when sometimes people grow up and actually manage to have an honest conversation to go, you know, this entire time I thought that you didn't miss me, that you were out there having a blast. I saw these pictures of you, you know, it, the technology is there, but we still have to give parents a certain amount of training. I mean, most parents don't know how to parent successfully in person. It's something that everybody kind of stumbles their way through. Imagine trying to do that when you have this massive distance between you and all these potential pitfalls. That's something that has to be 
people have to have some sort of level of, of training to do and whether or not we you know i'm beginning to work on doing a podcast series on this very thing um we're talking about doing things like partnering with the same companies that ship the barrels to include little booklets mm-hmm. so that when you go to ship the barrel, it says, you know, if, if you're sending this barrel to a child, here are five things to remember about what might be useful to add to, you know, add to the barrel. Some people have said to me, yeah. it was great to get all this brand name stuff, but my mother would make me something homemade, like some cookies and getting that in the barrel meant more to me than the cookies that she bought from Costco or wherever. Right. So right. parents have to be taught these things. It's not something that's not, it's going to come naturally to most parents and training people how to use the technology. And we also can't assume that the technology is as accessible as everybody thinks it is. I've met a lot of people who are, you know, not able to afford um, cell phones, smartphones. They have just very simple phones. Phone credit is still out of the reach of a lot of people working minimum wage jobs. Um, it, it isn't as accessible. We have to think about people at all levels of the spectrum. There's still amongst people in a lot of um, minimum wage jobs amongst our immigrant community. And we don't want to talk about it, but there's a, a level of illiteracy as well so simple things like sending text messages are not as easy for some people as you might think it is so we've got to kind of get in there and have all sorts of different kinds of ways to reach people where they're at and give them the tools to be able to do this successfully and it might not be possible for it to be a single organization but it Mm -hmm. it's about finding where people are already interacting whether it's with i know that the the um country associations do a lot of work informally in this the various high commissions there's 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 a lot of support that's quite informal and depends on the strength of the person who's engaging with the community at the time finding a way to formalize those things and coming to some sort of standard and agreement amongst all these different organizations that are already doing this work about how we help these families is probably the best way to approach it go go where people are already comfortable going going you know um melissa and mashida you have you may have seen this because there's a campaign in new york where there's these posters and it's showing you how to listen to someone who says they have a bad day or something have you seen those campaigns around mental health is there something available whereas i'm not a barrel child but i may know someone who's a barrel child tips on how to kind of listen to them or encourage them because like you said you know they're having conversations where they're comfortable whether you know as in, we sit in church, are we in the hairdresser, are we somewhere, how to kind of really know how to, to let them have that conversation without me as a child telling my cousin she lucky because she have our mother in America. I mean, at the time, I wouldn't know. And a lot of times adults don't really know how to support an, another adult that way. So are there any resources to help people kind of support people who are going through that if they're not at a point and like you said, you know, they may not, they may not be able to go to therapy. They don't have insurance to cover it or whatever the reason, but what can we do to support someone who has the barrel child experience and are still dealing with, you know, the, the repercussions or, or there's the long lasting impacts of that experience? Um, I think overall, um, as, as we've mentioned, so people are doing this work, right? So, you know, let, let's, I'll go back to Dr. Uh, Claudette Crawford Brown in Jamaica. There are these like migration checklists that do exist. There, there are family meetings that they, they have with uh, parents and, you know, before a parent migrates, how to, how to have a conversation with your child, how to set a schedule, how to let them know who they're staying with that kind of thing. Um, and what that like, you know, what that would look like in the household setting that schedule Um, And then when it comes to, you know, reunification, there are social workers, you know, in the New York area, um, some I've connected with in the Toronto area that are doing this. So people are doing it. It's not, I don't, it's not as widespread as, you know, I think we all would hope it to be. But I think that through the community that is being built of people who have, one, gone through this experience and two, others who have, um, you know, uh, worked in trying to understand or helping people to share their experiences through this these mediums, we're getting there. Um, however, I don't know that there's like, 
you know, there's no resource that I can directly point to. And I think that was one of the biggest things. That was the reason and, and why uh, Lisa Mashida and I connected on doing uh, the Beyond the Barrel series where we brought you know, several people together to not only discuss, but to, to figure out what kind of solutions can we come uh, to as a community, right? Not looking to other people to, to solve our problems, problems but yeah. how can we do it ourselves as a people? Um, so I don't think that we've necessarily found that, you know, one solution, but I think that it has started in so many different places, but that to, to continue that. But there are some things that, you know, uh, just un understanding. I, I have taken the stories, this story series, and through the Pulitzer Center, brought it to classrooms. And one of the things that stuck out to me about students, right, as young as 10 years old, when they understood why the why behind it like oh they're doing this for their family and you know or they or they wanted to know well why is the separation so long and then I said well think about the immigration process to come to a country particularly the United, the United States and what is happening right now with immigration a process that's already long now being made even longer. longer due to the backlogs um, and due to what's taking place with this administration. So I think understanding is key, you know, not being judgmental, but listening to understand, not listening to respond, but listening to understand. It helps you to be more empathetic to someone's uh, experiences. Um, and then from there, like we said, we talked about seeking out those people that have you know, that Caribbean heritage or background. But I just don't think that there's just one solution, but being able to understand that it's complex. It's not just a parent picked up and said, I'm going to go to America. There are economic, you know, um, factors that play into it. There are I immigration factors that play into the length of time that people are separated. And the average that I found was between five and eight years. And that's a long time, uh, particularly as we talked about when you, we, if you're thinking about at what age a child is left. So there's so many different factors. So that listening to understand um, and instead of to respond is a great place to start. And then I think the fact that films like Auntie or Scars of My Mother's Dream exist gives people I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me to say those films helped them mm. or those films allowed them to understand that they are not alone in this and that other people understand and that it's okay to feel the way you're feeling 20 years later. Mm -hmm. um, and you do not have to be ashamed of that. I think there's something very powerful in people being able to connect. I went to an event just last last week where Lisa's film, with, film was played and there was a lady in the audience crying and she said, that was me. Mm. Um, I think there's something very powerful about us being able to see ourselves, ourselves yeah. and our experiences, no matter if they're good or bad or in between, because there are a variation of experiences. Mm -hmm. And one thing I really appreciated about the Barrel Stories Project is that it showed you that not all of the experiences are were bad. bad. Yeah. And I think that's important for people to know too, there, but there are different Experience. experiences. And, and that brings me back to Feroza's original question. And I, I want each of you to kind of give me a, a little summary. She was like, you know, the effects, whether negative or positive. So we've been spending a lot of time on somewhat the positive, the negative impacts of what this experience is. What are some potential positive impacts from this whole, the, 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 the experience? Because there, I mean, like you said, Melissa, not everyone has had a negative experience. So what are, you know, what was something positive, Mashida, if anything, that came from your experience? Um, the, pos the positives um, are we have um, accomplished what my mom has set out to do to provide us a better life. We, we do live a, a very good quality of life here in America. I was able to um, um, obtain um, my master's degree first generation um, within our family. So within my family, we have made our mom proud. Um, all of us are basically college graduates. Um, so we have achieved that accomplishment for her. And... Um, I must say another positive is from the time we were reunited with um, our mom, there was never one day of separation in that sense, physical separation. Mm. Um, 
we have always been um, consistently living with our mom and she has always nurtured us in that sense. But um, you, that does not negate the emotional challenges that we have um, faced. And um, yeah, and that has been it. So it's a roller coaster for us. Yeah, yeah. Lisa, Melissa. I think in the best case scenarios, people will tell you that they feel like they had two, three parents, right? Mm -hmm. Um, In a situation where people were able to kind of find the right balance and parents were able to communicate well, people had the love of a grandmother or the love of an aunt or the love of, you know, somebody from outside the family who looked after them. Um, So they had several great maternal or paternal relationships in their lives. In terms of opportunity, you know, the Caribbean is a really vulnerable set of islands, right? A hurricane can come through any any year and wipe out whole economies. We don't, mm-hmm. you know, we're really reliant on tourism. Lots of things make us quite vulnerable. So the opportunities, unfortunately, are and continue to be outside until maybe we start to build up the, those, those economies ourselves a little bit more. Without migration, both the people who leave and take their children and those who are left behind because it's not just children who are left behind who benefit barrels don't just go to children they go to entire families the remittances go to entire families and the reality is people are going to leave they're going to leave because that's how our countries are able to function and continue to develop and to grow The, the question is only about when those people leave how do we keep those family ties strong and and prevent people from suffering and and also prevent the people who've migrated from feeling you know, like they've done something wrong Wrong. for feeling heavily overburdened with their responsibilities back home. I think when, when those things are in balance, we have a lot of success stories and we have a lot to be proud of. We're incredibly resilient people and incredibly, um, you know, loyal to our families, loyal to our communities, people who've migrated and have no more family ties still send barrels back to hospitals and to schools and, we're incredible and we should be patting ourselves on the back for what we do for each other and for our societies as a whole. We just need to look at the downsides of it and make sure that we minimize those downsides while we continue to reap the benefits. Mm. Good point. Good point. Melissa? Just to, Lisa really summed up everything I was thinking, which is awesome. I just, one other thing I wanted to add was that I think that um, a positive is that we have, uh, you know, through these experiences and now being it, it, being in a space where we are talking, not only talking about it, but putting some action behind it and using our platforms in different ways to address it. We've created stronger, both regional and diaspora connections on migration issues that are going to help the next generation. Mm-hmm. This is not just for us, right? This is not just for now and people who are in, being impacted now. We are addressing it now and working on ways to increase the ways we address this and put action behind mm-hmm. it, get resources, more resources to people because there are some out there. But we're also trying to ensure that we mitigate this for the next generation. Mm-hmm. Because as, as we mentioned, people are not going to stop, stop migrating right. just due to the economies of the Caribbean. That is going to be, and many other places around the world, that is going to be a fact of life. But how do we mitigate this emotional trauma or mitigate the the impact it has on family ties so that we can continue to develop strong children, strong leaders, and continue to build our families who, who people who come, who we come here to create better lives. And many people do do that, but you don't want to break down the family bond in the process. So I think that we have been able to create stronger ties regionally and in, 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 in the diaspora, which is, um, I think, crucial to, um, you know, because there's both sides, you know, it's the people who are left behind and the people who are here. And then that reunification, I think it's important for us to understand how we should and can work together in order to uh, move us forward as a, as a community, as a people, um, and not only look to it in that sense, but then to also to grow from it. Because if we're not talking about the good with the bad, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. disservice. Absolutely. And um, ladies, as we wrap up, please tell the community where they could find you. I'll definitely speak to you a little bit after we end recording to get resources I could put in the show notes, but just tell everyone where they could find you, website, social media handle. Mashida, you go. 
Um, I am on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, under the handle Mishida Phillip. So the Facebook mm-hmm. site for the movie is Scars of a Mother's Dreams. I will send it to you. Um, persons can reach me there if they would like to get access to seeing the film because um, it's not um, available publicly. Okay. And um, my personal email and, no, sorry, social media um, handle are Masida Phillips. Okay, got it. Uh, Lisa? Yes, for anybody who wants to either see Auntie, which is the film, A-U-N-T-I-E, a 60-minute short film, or to listen to some of the stories that I've collected over the past little while, you can go to www.barrelstories.org. And when you land on that front page, you'll have a choice of either watching the film or listening to the stories. There are currently eight, eight stories out there, and there's, there's more coming. And in terms of social media, I am on Facebook. I have one page for Auntie, the short film, and another page for Barrel Stories. Feel free to, to join either one and, and join in the conversation. Okay. And Melissa. So I'm on pretty much uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, uh, Melissa Noel Reports, M E L I S S A N O E L Reports.com. So I uh, feel please feel free to email me or send me a message on um, my pages on Facebook or Instagram. All right, ladies, thank you so much for joining this really critical and important conversation. Um, Thank you for sharing your experiences, your stories. Just really thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. And again, thank you for Rosa for, you know, asking me to cover it because, you know, I'm aware that Melissa did the story, but you know, more opportunities to have these discussions, diversify the platforms where we're having these discussions is so important. So as I like to say at the end of the show, walk good. You've been listening to Carry On Friends, a show about the Caribbean American experience. We post new episodes every two weeks. And if you want to learn more, buy merchandise or sign up for our newsletter, check out our website, carryonfriends.com. The Carry On Friends podcast is produced by Breadfruit Media. And new episodes are available every other Tuesday morning. You can listen to the podcast on the website, carryonfriends.com, or you can listen on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Mm-hmm.